the people station this is the bahamas tonight northern edition Good evening, Bahamas. I'm Shashina wolf Barkas, and as always, it is so great to have you with us. Top News Speaker of the House of Assembly and Member of Parliament for Nassau Village, Halton Moultrie, resigning from the Free National Movement Party by way of an official letter yesterday. In part, Moultrie's letter stated, my patriotic and not to be compromised conviction on fundamental es essentials of democracy and good governance, such as the separation of powers, autonomy and independence of the legislature and judiciary, accountability and transparency, freedom of information and respect for the con Constitution makes my continued affiliation and association divergent and untenable. While some called his move shocking, the vice chairman of the Free National Movement says the speaker's resignation from the party was not surprising. The National Vice Chairman of the Free National Movement, David Thompson, says the resignation of Halton Mutri is not surprising given his provocative behavior recently. He says this latest move is nothing more than a distraction. Thompson says while the resignation was not expected over the past several months, the Speaker of the House, Halton Mutri, made several public decorations. So he has been threatening to resign. Uh, as it relates to issues that he think are important to him and which he may believe are constitutionally important for him to, to try and reform. The Progressive Liberal Party's chairman issuing a statement on the resignation that notes the sudden resignation of House Speaker Halton Moultrie presents increasing evidence that the FNM is imploding as the wheels are falling off one by one under the weight of what appears to be increasing division in the party's leadership ranks. While we put that question of whether or not the FNM is imploding to the vice chairman. My answer to that is again, the FNM is strong. The FNM is resilient. The FNM has 32 members in Parliament as we speak. And even though Moultrie resigned from the Free National Movement, he is still the Speaker of the House, as he cannot be removed by the government majority, which means he will remain in place unless he resigns or the House is dissolved for a general election. And when asked if he believes that Moultrie's resignation at this particular time was deliberate or strategic, here's what he had to say. I think what he did, he, he, he obviously thought about, and I think that in his mind this might have been a clever thing to do. But I always say that the will of the people is the will of God, and right now the will of the people expressed by the people in its last election is the mandate that the FNM governs by. So we will not be distracted. Now Thompson says he leaves it to the party leader to remain focused, especially during this time in the best interest of the party and the country. Well, the nation's leader with a speaking engagement in the Abacos today, Prime Minister Dr. Hubert Minnis was the feature speaker at the commissioning ceremony for the Hope Town Shoreline Stabilization Project. Italia Hall fills us in. The nation's leader and delegation on Elbow Key and Hope Town Abaco for the opening of a Dune Road Shoreline Stabilization Project. The Prime Minister was accompanied by the Deputy Prime Minister and Minister of Works, the Honorable Desmond Bannister, and Member of Parliament for South and Central Abaco, James Albury. Back in 1999, Hurricane Floyd caused severe damage to the edge of Queens Highway and nearby sand dune on Elbow Key, resulting in the loss of beach sand in front of the dune. Various attempts were made to reconstruct the dune in 2011, but the dune was again severely damaged by Hurricane Irene and a subsequent tropical storm. Those series of events accelerated the shoreline erosion, which ultimately damaged the seaside edge of the road, leading to a sharp and dangerous drop-off.
In 2019, the Ministry of Public Works developed a design to repair the road and stabilize the existing dune and shoreline, and a contract worth some $3 million was signed back in 2019 with the Bahamas Marine Construction Company, but Hurricane Dorian and the COVID-19 pandemic delayed the project. The scope of work included the rehabilitation of 790 feet of roadway, the construction of 850 feet of concrete retaining wall with steel railing and backfilling, and planting of dune vegetation. Work was completed in August of 2020. The Prime Minister also addressing the Special Economic Recovery Zone Relief Order while in Abaco. It was enacted following Hurricane Dorian to provide tax relief as a part of the government's comprehensive strategy to rebuild the devastated islands of Abaco, its Keys and Grand Bahama. Prime Minister Minnis says that in addition to the VAT, customs and tax concessions, more than $11 million in business license fees have been waived for some 4,475 companies in the Special Economic Recovery Zone and close to $6 million was dispersed by September of 2019 due to the unprecedented damage caused by Hurricane Dorian. The government was also required to deviate from its fiscal targets to fund over $138 million in direct support to impacted families and businesses during the 2019-2020 budget year. The Prime Minister says while there is still much work to be done throughout Abaco and Grand Bahama, progress is being made. It's Halia Hall, ZNS Network News. In other news, the COVID-19 vaccine consultative committee giving an update on preparations to distribute the vaccine in the Bahamas. Chairperson of the National COVID-19 Vaccine Consultative Committee, Dr. Dal Regis, at a press conference on Thursday advising that all aspects of the COVID-19 vaccine distribution plan will be tested to ensure the safe and effective distribution of the vaccine to those who choose to take it. Megan Shepard has more in this report. The Bahamas was notified earlier this week that it could receive 100,000 doses of the AstraZeneca Oxford vaccine starting the second half of February through the COVAX facility. And a plan to distribute COVID-19 vaccines is being finalized in preparation for the arrival of vaccines in the country. Dr. Dal Regis says the distribution and administration of the COVID-19 vaccine in the Bahamas will be a great operational challenge and perhaps the most difficult that the public health sector has ever faced. The vaccines will be administered at approved sites in communities across the Bahamas to ensure increased access and equitable distribution. All approved sites must be accessible, safe, and appropriate for the distribution of the vaccine. Three priority groups have been proposed to receive the vaccine. Group 1 will consist of healthcare workers, uniformed branches, and elder care providers. Group 2 will include persons with disabilities, persons living in congregate settings, critical workers in high-risk settings, other essential service workers, persons with comorbidities and underlying conditions, and sea, air, and ground personnel. Group 3 will include all others not previously identified. Special provisions will also be made for those with disabilities and identified priority groups. The COVID-19 vaccination process will take place in four steps. Registration, vaccination, monitoring of adverse events, and certification. Pre-registration for the vaccine will be available online and at registration centers across the Bahamas once sites have been finalized, said Dr. Dal Regis. The rollout of the first batch of vaccines is expected to be carried out over a six-week period. It is proposed that during weeks one through four, vaccines will be administered on the islands of New Providence, Grand Bahama, and Bimini. During weeks two to five, vaccines will be administered on Abaco, the Abaco Keys, and Exuma. During weeks four through six, vaccines will be administered on Andros, the Berry Islands, and Eleuthera. The remainder of the family islands will also be covered during this period. On islands with small populations, health teams will immunize all eligible residents. These islands will not follow the prioritized group rollout. Local teams will be supported by mobile teams from New Providence. 
vaccines will be transported by air to the family islands in portable coolers. It is anticipated that anyone receiving a vaccine will be given a COVID-19 vaccination certificate after completing the vaccine process. In the case of a two-dose vaccine, certificates will be received following the second dose. According to health officials, the presentation of the certificate may be associated with travel in the future. This is a potential requirement that continues to be discussed internationally. Now, the COVID-19 vaccines will be available free of charge to eligible adults and will not be mandatory. Megan Shepard, ZNS Network News. Now to the latest COVID-19 dashboard. Nine new COVID-19 cases reported in the country yesterday. Eight cases in New Providence and one in Exuma, bringing the total number of cases to 8,256. There are 15 cases hospitalized. Two persons are hospitalized in Grand Bahama and the remaining 13 are in New Providence. There are 1,208 active cases, 6,819 recovered cases, and the death toll stands at 176. Switching gears now, a paralyzed man says one altercation with his landlord could possibly result in homelessness for him and his family. Tonight, he's making an impassioned appeal for the Grand Bahama community to assist him in any way possible. Bedridden Grand Bahamian Arnold Johnson says he has been living in Baslane for four years. Recently, the duplex where he lives was sold, and this Monday, he says a simple altercation between his wife and the new landlord could now possibly leave him and his wife, along with their 10-year-old daughter, homeless. They come and do construction work in the kitchen and in the bathroom, and my wife said, hey, why are y'all using our power like this? Who can, play, who can pay for the power? Johnson says that simple question of asking the landlord who is going to pay for the electricity being used during the renovations has erupted into an explosive situation. The paralyzed man says that he and his family rely on his national insurance check, which is about $400 a month. He alleges that as a result of the argument, the owner threatened to increase the rent of $500 to even more. We can go hustle, we hustle money to pay all the money, we give you all this, five, our last $500 and pay all, y'all come in the place, break up the bathroom, break up the kitchen, we ain't eat for three days, and then when we ask y'all about it, y'all say y'all can put us out. The man adds that the fact that his wife has not worked in a year and he is paralyzed makes it unconscionable that a landlord would put a tenant who doesn't have back pay of rent out at a time like this. The, the money that I get is $400. A nice guy take the $400, my wife would probably go out and hustle and then we, we find $100 to pay the rent. Social service, we are... Uh, I, I, I made a complaint to them six months ago so they helped me out to pay the previous landlord. They, they ain't do nothing for me. The church people once in a while is come around and, and, and you know, mm -hmm. and try their best to do something for me. The man received a letter this week instructing him of his eviction notice and with being without a place to lay his head becoming more of reality, he's making this appeal. Like last week, all we seen was grits. <laughs> you know, tell, I mean, with some need because I, you know, all I'm saying to the public, if they could, could help me in any kind of way, I will appreciate it. God knows. Right now, I just waiting to see what happened to the end of the month. See what they can do. People should learn how to, to treat people better. My friends are there who know me, or who still. My phone number is 441-0069. Now our ZNS News team spoke with the landlord's representative Kimberly Russell, who is giving a different story. While she admits that the altercation was a result of the renovations to the duplex, she says there was never any suggestion of raising the rent. Um, incapacitated 
you would have think that he would have been encouraging the improvements to be made because ultimately as someone um, myself living with someone who's incapacitated cleanliness is needed and the place needed repairs so that's why we further reiterating why would you object to someone making it better for you especially in your condition when your health is at risk and this is something that would help your condition so they're not being forced out because he is incapacitated they're being forced out because they had a poor attitude towards the landlord wanting to make improvements on their behalf there was no damage done to the furniture he simply was working in the kitchen and you know, it just was mind-boggling. We didn't understand where the aggression came from. And if it was from the use of power, I'm sure that there was less than $5 worth of power used. Now, Russell adds that the tenant on the other side of the duplex had no issues with the badly needed renovations. No, the other tenant is actually looking forward to the improvements that are being made. She's already moved her items out of the way so that the contractor could come in and do the work. And she's excited that finally something is being done to make the apartment better. In news from the crime beat, police on Grand Bahama arresting four illegal migrants. Reports are that on Thursday, shortly before 2 p.m., officers of the Flying Squad, acting on information and armed with a search warrant, went to an apartment complex on Charles Chillingworth Court. There, they searched and discovered in the apartment four illegal migrants, two females and two males. Now, they were all handed over to the immigration authorities. Investigation into this matter are continuing. Stay with us. We'll be back right after this.